Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Caitlin Hodges. I'm very happy that you all are here. Um, welcome to our virtual resource fair for the blind and vision impaired. We sincerely hope that each of you will find the information presented very useful. Okay, I am Sandy Hopkins, a uh, librarian at the Central Library, and I'm here to introduce Marilee Kentlin to you. She lost her vision gradually over the years due to retinitis pigmentosa. She has a bachelor's degree in biology, a master's in speech therapy, and another master's degree in vision rehabilitation teaching. She is married and has four grown children. Her husband was in the Navy for 30 years and during that time, they moved frequently and did a lot of traveling. She has worked outside the home, both as a speech therapist and as a vision rehabilitation teacher. She is now retired and lives with her husband, two cats and guide dog. She enjoys cooking, reading, hiking, cross country skiing, and is learning to knit and use a Mac computer. Thank you. Um, when Caitlin asked me what did I want to talk on, um, as a rehab teacher, lots of different things went through my head. Um, but I kept coming back to recreational activities. Um, when I was working on my master's degree in rehab teaching, of course, we had to do a lot of research and so forth. And one of the things I found in re doing the research is that uh, most blind or vision impaired kids and adults um, fell behind their sighted peers in exercise and they had seemed to have more trouble with weight gain and obesity. And that just was straight across the board. And, um, you know, we can all understand why. Um, I lost my vision. Well, I was diagnosed with RP at the age of five. So as a kid, um, I could get out and ride my bicycle. I roller skated. Um, I ran around the neighborhood with the kids. Um, you know, they knew I couldn't see after dark, so they just grabbed my hand and pulled me along with them. But it was no big deal. When we started school, however, they had the organized sports, things like dodgeball, softball, volleyball, basketball. And obviously, I was just not real good at any of those sports. Um, I was always the last one chosen to be on anyone's team. Um, and when I, I could have written a book on how to avoid PE classes. I had more excuses than, <laughs> than you could think of to get out of PE. Um, we run a four, nine week session for the school year. And the one nine weeks where we did calisthenics and gymnastics, I was fine, but it was the the, um, can you still hear me? Oh dear, I wonder if that worked. Yes, we can still hear you, please go ahead. Okay, I heard talking in the background, so I got worried. Um, and, um, but the, it, was the, it was the organized sports with the word ball in it that really just put me into a tailspin. When I got out of high school, I swore that I would never do anything sports connected again, except walking. And I was like that until I was in my 50s. And um, my husband came to me one day and said, you know, Marilyn, we need to find a way to, to play together. The kids are going off to college. Um, my, my vision had worsened quite a bit by then. I was reading uh, with the CCTV, um, very large print, and um, was on my second guide dog, actually. and. Um, he said, you know, we, we need to find a way to play together. Well, I was looking at an American Council of the Blind Braille Forum magazine one day and found an article on Ski for Light. Well, I had never been on skis in my life, but I thought, well, Ed said he wanted us to find something we could play to together, so let's give it a whirl. So when he came home from work that night, I told him about it, and his reaction was to laugh uproariously. He said, Marilee, you've got to be kidding me. We are on our 50s. We have never seen a pair of skis, much less been on them. 
we're going to go to this event. We're going to be the oldest ones there. Um, and blind people and skis shouldn't even be said in the same sentence. Well, when he went to work the next day, I promptly called and made reservations for us to go. Um, he practically had a heart attack when he got home that night. And I told him that he was a brave soul and we went, that was in the year 2000. And we've been going ever since, and he's now the president of our regional organization. So, um, sighted people can be made to change their minds about what blind and vision impaired people can do. Um, and I also want to point out that, well, you know, we were in our fifties when we started this. So you're, you're never too old or too blind to try something new and, and to learn a new skill. Now, Ski for Light is an organization that teaches blind, vision impaired, and mobility impaired adults how to cross country ski. Uh, we, have, we started out at our regional, which is in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And um, we went there a couple of winters, and then we started on the summer program. The summer program was at the same place, it's Sports for Health. And at the Sports for Health event, I tried lots of things that I had, would never have thought that I would have done. Um, I tried tandem biking, canoeing, kayaking, um, fly fishing, archery, and target shooting, and horseback riding. And some of those I liked more than other things. Um, but it just gave me the opportunity to try all of these new physical activities. And my mind was slowly changing that blind and vision impaired people can enjoy recreational activities along with a sighted peer. Um, in fact, I liked horseback riding so much that, um, uh, you know, I came home and looked it up on the web and found that there were adaptive horseback riding facilities here where I live in Virginia and got hooked up with an organization. And I think we live in a good time as far as adaptive sports are concerned. Um, like I said, around here, we have the adaptive horseback riding. Um, I have heard of a blind sailing groups, rowing groups, uh, blind golfers association. There are just all sorts of, of organization that are um, geared towards blind or vision impaired adults. Um, now, we, we, um, in 2003, we went to our first international ski for light. And that it's international because people from all over the world come to it. Those are normally held somewhere in North America. And, you know, we've had the opportunity to visit many, many places um, with Ski for Light, with International Ski for Light, and meet people from all around the world. P uh, um, there's a large conting contingency that comes over from Norway because that's where Ski for Light got its original start. But there are people from Canada, um, Scotland, Japan, China, Sweden, Denmark, Barbados, and from most of the United States, from most of the 50 states also. And so you get to meet lots of new people and learn that new sport. Now, the way cross-country skiing works with Ski for Light, there are tracks laid down. And the blind or vision impaired or mobility impaired skiers in one set of tracks, and they have a sighted guide um, who is in the other set of tracks. And you just ski along together. Um, you're not tethered together or anything like that. You just ski along beside each other, or sometimes the guide will be um, in front of or behind, whatever the um, uh, blind or vision impaired skier prefers. And um, so that's, you know, you're independent out there on, on those skis. And that, that is just such a, a good freeing feeling. Um, there are also uh, running groups that, um, and I know several runners, and they're usually tethered to um, a, a sighted companion, and they run marathons. Now, I've never been interested in running, so that's not something that I personally would be interested in, but there may be somebody out there 
um, who is interested in that. Um, and so I would suggest that if you are interested in getting into, um, you know, one of these organized activities, um, get on the web. Um, if you can't get on the web, get a friend or family member to get on the web and, and Google adaptive whatever. Uh, you know, skiing, rowing, sailing, horseback riding, and, and you'll be surprised how many groups actually pop up. Um, and I know that the two main problems for those of us who are blind or vision impaired when it comes to sports activities are number one, transportation, and number two, just a sighted person to go with you, at least in the beginning, and get you started on some of these things. And um, I'm lucky, I'm very blessed. I have a sighted husband who is, despite his initial reaction, is very willing to try new things with me. Um, in fact, fall 2019, um, we, I suggest, I told him I'd always been try, wanted to try um, um, wall climbing. And um, he said, okay, and, and so we did. And, and we had a blast, you know, doing that. So he's, he's still willing to try new things with me now, <laughs> which is good. Um, but another thing to do, you know, if you're not blessed with a side husband who is, who is willing to get out there and do these things with you, is talk to everybody you know. Um, when I was, once again, when I was in graduate school, when I was in grad school, I had to go away. I did most of my courses online, but I had to spend two, 10 weeks in Philadelphia area and then 14 weeks up in Portland, Maine, um, doing classwork and internship and things like that. Well, as you know, it's really hard to rent an apartment for 10 weeks or 14 weeks. Um, it's also very expensive. So I just I started talking to everybody I knew, um, friends, family, I went to church, Lions Club, walking through the grocery store and the, um, the checkout girl who talks to me all the time. You know, I just asked everybody, do you know anybody in Philadelphia, Portland, Maine, who has a route that they would rent to me for the, this amount of time? And in both cases, I was able to find somebody. Now, it didn't happen overnight. It took several months, several weeks for this to happen. But I was able to find people this way. And I think the same thing can happen with finding um, a walking buddy or a tandem bike buddy um, or a canoeing buddy. You know, just talk to everybody you know and say, you know, what do you do for fun? Um, you go hiking? I'd love to go hiking sometime. Can we do it together? And um, you may even convert another sighted person um, to the realization that, that blind and vision impaired people can do a lot of things that most people don't think they can do. Um, then there's also crafts. If you're not the physical um, person, um, but there's also crafts. I'm learning to knit right now, and I'm doing that um, on an e an email group actually. Um, and um, the lady who's teaching it is blind, and we are knitting um, a dishcloth a month for a year. And she sends out the patterns and she's very good at describing if you put your needles in this position and, um, you know, how to do the yarn and so forth. So I'm actually learning, um, learning to knit. Um, and there are other craft activities that blind or vision impaired people can also learn to do. Um, once again, you just need someone, maybe you need a little extra help to get you started. Um, but, you know, once you get started, it is, um, it, it, it is very good for both your physical health and your mental health to, to be able to say, I, I can do these things and, and know that you can do these things and feel good about yourself. Um, because of my school experiences with sports and everything, I really did not have good self-esteem growing up. Um, you know, I just, I'm clumsy, I'm klutzy, I can't do anything. You know, that was my attitude. But once I started Ski for Light and then all those other activities, um, you know, my mind frame has changed. And I know now that, yeah, okay, I'm still a little bit klutzy. Um, but, um, but I'm not 
quite as bad as I thought I was. And, 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 and that's a huge mental breakthrough for me. Um, and I heard that somebody put out the, the ski for light website. Thank you very much um, for doing that. I was going to give that, but somebody beat me to it. Good job. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, Caitlin, I give you permission to give out my um, email to anyone who would like to, um, to learn about this. And especially if you want to go to the regional ski for lighter sports for health. Like I said, my husband is the president of it. Um, so you can email me, we'll get you on our mailing list and, you know, would love to have you join us, um, in, in those activities. So, um, does anybody have any questions? There's no questions in the chat so far, um, so I think we'll wait until the end and see if any uh, chat questions come in or if there's any questions at the end of all of our panel presentations for this section. Um, and then we'll come back and revisit those if um, if anybody wants to put any in the meantime. Um, okay. Sandy, do you want to do the next set of bios? Let me introduce Holly Frisch. She grew up in Williamsburg until she was 12 years old. Before leaving Williamsburg in 1964, she spent a year in Minnesota, a year in New York, and a year in Stockholm. And then her father accepted a new job at Northern Illinois University, where she completed her secondary education in 1969. Her bachelor's degree from Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin, is in political science with even more courses in French. Her master's degree under the auspices of the linguistics department at Southern Illinois University is in teaching English as a foreign language. Professionally, she has been a teacher's aide, editor, writer, fine arts telemarketer, vocational, excuse me, vocational rehabilitation counselor, employment specialist, public relations specialist and small business owner. Besides her guide dog, Kenny, she has a pet dog and three cats. Fredericksburg has been her home since 2010. And she asked, did you know that March 16th is Volunteers for the Blind 15th anniversary? Thank you, Holly, go ahead. Thank you for in inviting me. Throughout my high school and college years, I got what I thought was a lot of work experience. I was a, I was a volunteer in the, in the school system primarily and as a Sunday school teacher, but as a volunteer, and I'm sorry to say, as a blind person, the expectations for me weren't very high. And I thought I was really hot stuff, I'm sorry to say. I fell victim to that, isn't that amazing syndrome. So when I got my first job after college, I got fired. I mean, they, they told me that they weren't reading my contract, but I got fired and I deserved to be fired because I was obnoxious and missed know-it-all with my nose in the air. And much later, I found out about programs with job coaches that prevented this kind of thing from happening. Uh, but, uh, so, then when I became a vocational rehabilitation counselor, I was really excited because in Virginia, people can become part of the vocational rehabilitation system when they're as young as 14 and get into summer work experiences because employers are much more tolerant of very young people who make mistakes. I was 24 years old when I, I got my first job. So I loved placing people in summer work experiences or even in un 
unpaid work experiences throughout the year because it did two things. It, they were young people. It gave them a chance to make their mistakes before anything really terrible happened. And it also provided a community service. I always said that it was an opportunity to assure employers that blind people don't bite. So 15 years ago, when I formed Volunteers for the Blind, uh, its original missions were to provide volunteer readers and volunteer shopping assistants, not A-N-C-E, A-N-C-S, people who were uh, not shoppers, but shopping assistants. But I moved my offices. We started in, in North Woodbridge, then I moved to Montclair. And when I was in Montclair, I met a young man who I hadn't come across in 10 years. He was my vocational rehabilitation client at one point, and he was recovering from a traumatic brain injury and getting ready to go back to college. But his family asked him if he would wait just a little longer because his grandmother, who was 90 years old, needed someone to keep an eye on her until they could get an appropriate nursing home place for her. He loved her very much, so he was happy to do that. He and his brother gave her a wonderful 90th birthday party, and very sadly, or maybe very happily, it was such a wonderful birthday party that she went to sleep that night, and she didn't wake up. So this young man was left at loose ends, he didn't have his grandmother to take care of. He couldn't go to college because the semester had already started. And my housemate, who had begun to like him very well, said, can't you think of anything for him to do during the day? And I said, well, maybe. So I capitalized on what I knew and called his vocational rehabilitation counselor and asked her if she would work with me to get him into an unpaid work experience. So he was with us for 13 weeks. That's what started our internship program, and that was back in 2009. And after 13 weeks, we adored him, but we had to tell him that we didn't think he was quite ready to go to college. He needed to acquire some alternative techniques of blindness. So we helped him get some training at one of the uh, at one an outstanding national orientation center, and then we arranged for him to have an internship. He was an intern in Congressman Whitman's office. And they were pleased with him. They told us that if we wanted to send them another intern, they would look favorably on that request. And they worked with us because there were certain skills and work habits he needed to develop. It's very important to us as part of our internship program to send people out into the community because we get very protective of our interns, and we need to send them out so that if there's something we're not spotting, someone else can catch it and we can we can get, we can address it so that what happened to me does not happen to them. I've now had ten or eleven interns or that's what I call them now because the in, the unpaid work experience program as I knew it in the 1990s no longer exists. But each intern has been different and presented us with different challenges. We had one who came to work on her first day and finished what I asked her to do. 
And without asking me, she called her mom and said, okay, I finished what I did. Come and get me. And the first lesson we had to teach her was that a work day has set hours and that good practice before you leave your job in the afternoon is to say to your employer, I'm on my way out. Is there anything else you need me to do before I go? And she felt really bad about it. Probably I could have been a lot kinder and more uh, diplomatic the way I talked to her about it. But I said to her, it's all right. You're not going to get fired. I'm going to do something 10 times worse. You're going to have to come back tomorrow and try again. And she, she turned out to be one of the best interns I've ever had. I had another young lady who was having trouble with unwanted attention on the bus. So she so she didn't want she didn't want to take the bus anymore. And her Lions Club volunteer volunteered to provide transportation for her. And I was a meanie. I said no. Because I knew she was going back to college. I said she needs to ride these buses. She's going to have to work this out. And one of the problems was that she wasn't, I, I, will, I will be the first to say this is subjective, but the problem was probably partly her wearing apparel. And we kept telling her that we thought maybe it was a little too low cut. And she didn't care until we finally said, you know, you're having trouble on the buses. You're getting attention you don't want. And rightly or wrongly, uh, this could have something to do with it. And it's, and it's something you could do to minimize that attention because you need to be able to ride the buses. And also, when we went to professional meetings once or twice, we couldn't take her with us. We said, we're sorry, we can't take you today. You're not dressed appropriately. And I think it really hit home one day when I had to call someone and ask for someone to come and stay with her because we don't leave our we don't leave our interns alone most of the time. We don't feel that's a responsible thing to do. So in essence, I had to call a babysitter for her because I had to go to my meeting, but I couldn't take her the uh, the way she was dressed. And the first three weeks were pretty difficult. The next three, of, the next three weeks were wonderful. The cutest thing that happened was I did an interim report for her vocational rehabilitation counselor. The counselor was concerned and decided we needed to have a meeting. and the, Counselor showed her what I'd written and said, well, have you seen what Holly wrote? And the young lady said, yes. And the counselor said, well, what do you think about it? And she said, well, I can't be mad because everything she said was true. And we said, but that's okay. Only half the summer is gone. That's why we're doing this now. And by the end of her summer with us, I couldn't have been sorrier. To see her leave, she, she did a she did 100% turnaround, and I would have been glad to have her back anytime she wanted to be there. So we we continue this program. I've just been asked by Project Rise if I'm in, would be interested in providing a volunteer internship for someone. And I'm starting to talk with this young lady in the hope that she'll be interested in, in coming to us. We love working with our interns. I would say it's the high point of every day of our week. 
we've had a very long-term intern, and we just finished providing her several months of computer instruction and helped her to get a new computer. And I'm really hoping that it's going to provide her some very worthwhile activities to do at home. I can't say very much good about COVID, but it forced us to explore technological opportunities. And this is a young lady I'm very seriously consider recommending for the program that I think Bobek and Caitlin are part of where people are re are reading books and rating them for the Library of Congress. And the young lady I've been working with probably won't be able to do it exactly the way that it's intended. She doesn't know Excel, but her computer skills are good enough now that if we adapt and we work with Word, I think she'll be able to do a very creditable job. It will keep her well occupied and it will allow her to do something she enjoys anyway, which is read lots and lots of books. Most of our interns are from the Fredericksburg area, but we've had some come as, from as far away as Richmond because we have worked with vocational rehabilitation counselors, even though there is no formal unpaid work experience. Last summer, I had an intern who wanted to learn more about nonprofit business. And her counselor allowed her to come and spend one day a week with us, learning how a nonprofit business operates. And we even allowed her to practice some skills. She assisted me with supervision, and she assisted me because she has a much stronger background than I do in regular counseling as opposed to vocational rehabilitation counseling. So there are all kinds of creative ways that we can get people in here, and there's practically there's practically no situation that we don't want to work with. Uh, it's a, almost anything is a very worthwhile challenge to us, as long as we can keep everybody safe. Thank you very much for your presentation, Holly. Um, we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Um, did you have anything else to add to uh, your presentation before we move on to Alex's? Not really, except not in, but if, uh, if, if anyone is interested in an in, in, in internship, please don't hesitate to call and we'll do our best to work something out. Fantastic. We'll post your um, contact information in just a second for your organization. Um, in the meantime, um, Sam, do you want to do Alex's biography? So our presenter, his name was Alex Castillo, and he works with the blind and low vision Virginians through the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. Through engaging instruction on assistive technology, home management, independent living, advocacy, and community resources, he focuses on helping clients problem solve and feel confident and comfortable in their home and community. So we look forward to some information from him later. Alex um, Castillo was actually able to join us and he can do his presentation on self-advocacy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so just a, a little refresher on my bio because it was a, a long time ago that it was said. Uh, I worked for DPBI, the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired. Um, I'm one of the rehabilitation teachers that works in the Northern Virginia region. And so we do anything from access technology, home management, uh, basically whatever somebody wants to do what they're having trouble doing or figuring out what it is that they want to do and might have trouble doing. Um, we kind of step in there and help people get 
to their goals. With that said, <clears throat> um, you need, as an individual, to learn to advocate for what those goals may be. I'm going to start off with a little story. It's very short. And then I'm going to go into some points uh, on how to address that self-advocacy issue. And so just kind of think about how this story, how you would deal in this situation if you are not yourself low vision or blind. Think about how you would feel in this situation if you saw this happening. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say Mrs. M is retired. She is 72 and she got a diagnosis of, you know, um, let's just say her glaucoma has been eating at her vision uh, for about five years now. So she's had some time to kind of get adjusted. So she knows kind of, you know, a couple of things. She's still living on her own. Her kids come over every once in a while um, and kind of help out with, with stuff. So this is a Friday night. And she's got this big Amazon box, okay? And she's ordered this bookshelf, and she says to herself, okay, so I can't see to read the instruction manual, but I've done so many of these IKEA-type Amazon, you know, bookshelf thingies that I think I can figure this out. But I need to be very careful. And so she starts taking the pieces one by one, laying them out, Okay, in an order that makes sense to her. And when she's done organizing, cleaning up the area, she knows where she's going to put this, uh, you know, she's going to put this once it's finished. Um, her kids come, you know, her kids, you know, they're not really kids. They're like in their 30s and 40s. And they start talking to her. They're having a good time. Her daughter disappears into the bedroom where the box is and all the materials are. Uh, Mrs. M doesn't really, you know, notice anything, but she comes back, she goes into the bedroom and she sees her daughter has taken all of those pieces. She carefully put aside and she has started to build that bookshelf. I'm going to pause here. I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to kind of take that in and see how you feel about that. There's no way, there's no wrong way to feel about this. And you can, I have my notifications turned off. So if you're putting something in the chat, I won't be able to read it, but somebody uh, in the library team uh, might be able to. Okay. All right. You thought about it? Did you get angry? Did you get uh, happy about it? Were you thankful? Keep, keep that thought in mind. Okay. So I'm going to start off with saying self-advocacy takes courage. It's not always about fighting institutions or about your civil rights. Sometimes it's just a little thing like, you know, telling your family members not to do certain things, setting certain boundaries for yourself. You've got to remember that you matter and that you are not a burden to others. You've got to recognize that you are the most important person in a situation or an issue that concerns you, okay? You gotta know yourself. And if applicable, you gotta know your rights. You've got to know your rights. Okay, I'm gonna, as I read through these, I'm gonna start giving, you know, more realistic uh, and realistic sort of situations where these might be useful, okay? <clears throat> Number one. Keep track of your records. Understand that doing this, learning how to do this is a possibility. If you're working with someone like myself and you say, hey, I, I want to be able to read my bank statements. Uh, I want to be able to read my mail, have access to financial records. That is something that we can work on. That is also something that if you, if you feel like you have an ally, an ally in your family or a friend, that you can reach out and take care of that. Sometimes you don't have one and so you it, you might just have to uh, sometimes pay someone to help you access those things and so you're able to access it yourself. But just remember that those things are important. You need to be able to pull, you know, to say, this is how much I have in the bank. 
uh, this is where this money is going. This is a letter that I answered. Okay. You can prioritize these things. Number two, start small. It doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to, you know, walk into your doctor's office and say, I demand accessible uh, medication. Although that is a good thing to do. But, um, you know, you can start little. You can start simply by asking that doctor if you can please read or tell you what his prescriptions are. That way, when you go to the pharmacy to pick them up, you have an idea of what you're getting as opposed to just passively going to the pharmacy and picking up a prescription and not knowing what it is you're doing. Prepare. You've got a meeting coming up with a, a medical professional. You've got a meeting coming up with a rehabilitation professional. Uh, you've got a dinner coming up with friends and family. Prepare. Okay, know that some things, if, especially if you're recently low vision or blind, they're going to take a little, a little more time. And it's okay. It's okay. As long as you know that you're, you need that preparation, uh, as long as you need, you know, you need that extra time, you can communicate that. And you will feel prepared. Okay. Whatever process you're in, I'm moving on to the next one. Be an active participant in that process. Clearly express what your needs are. So I'll give an example. Um, I just spoke with one lady this morning, and she was very adamant what she wanted. She just wanted a way for her to read. Okay? And she didn't want home management. She didn't want... Anything else that I was offering, she just wanted information on devices that she can use to read. At least that's what it, she got across to me. And so that helped me in not wasting her time. I wasn't showing her things that she did not want to see. I wasn't giving her techniques that she already knew about. I just gave her the information that she wanted. But I wouldn't have known how to do that if she hadn't been so direct. Next point. Set realistic goals for what you want to achieve. Now, this was a tough one, okay, especially with low vision and blindness, because um, you may have been a you may have been a race car driver and no more. That's out. Of, that's out of the question. You're not going to do that anymore. At least in 2021, maybe in 2025 or 2020, you know, 2030, but not in 2021. That's not going to happen. Uh, you may want to physically read. You may want to pick up a book or a letter and read that again. And you may notice that it's extremely frustrating and you just can't do it. So you gotta set some realistic goals. Um, and those really depend, I'm not gonna tell you what they are, what they are not. I'm just gonna say that you've gotta kind of look at yourself in terms of where you wanna be and how likely it is that that thing's gonna happen. Uh, and be realistic about it. With that said, you need to have enough information to make that choice. You can't set a realistic goal unless you know what the resources are, unless you know how much energy you're willing to put into that. Um, um, and you also need to be able to get information to, to know that there are other individuals like yourself who are also advocating for themselves and that they might have an answer that you don't have. And so one way to learn to be a better self-advocate is to be around other people who are doing that very thing. Now, <clears throat> this one, a lot of people don't think about, but it, it is very helpful. Um, when needed, so either at a doctor's office or at a government's office or uh, at a family friend or uh, wherever you feel that you need support, make sure that you can identify those people that can give you that support, whether it's a friend, whether it's a family member, whether it's a, an advocate from a low vision or blindness organization that can step in and kind of 
help you guide things. Um, be aware that those people are out there and you may have those people around you. So for example, um, in the story that I gave originally about Mrs. M, you know, her daughter at that point was an, an ad, uh, uh, one of her advocates, but or her allies. Uh, but you, we don't know. Maybe now if Mrs. M says, hey, you know, this really hurt my feelings. I was really working hard on this. The next time that one of the other kids comes in and tries to do something, her daughter will step in and say, hey, no, no, no. Mom's got this. Mom knows what she's doing. Okay, so that would be that would be an ally, a good ally for her. Um, I want to open things up because I know there's a lot of information that just went by kind of very quickly. Um, and if you guys remember the story that I told in the beginning about the woman who was building a cap, you know, a bookshelf and her daughter came in and kind of started doing it after she put all the started putting all the pieces together and things like that. Um, I want to know if you guys have any thoughts about that situation. Alex, can I ask in your story, did the family, did Mrs. M end up being able to communicate to her family that she wanted to go through with yes. that project? Well, that's where we are. Okay. Because that's where the self-advocacy comes in. Um, the original Mrs. M was not able to. Um, and she kind of resigned herself and really didn't, do one thing or another. She kind of just said, okay, well, I, I guess this happens. This is going to happen now, you know, which is probably not what we want as I'm, I'm low vision and, uh, and blind myself. And so I, I can understand the, the sentiment of not wanting to cause a ruckus with self advocating at the same time. It's important to know that, people do listen and they could only listen if you speak or if you write or if you communicate with them. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello, we can hear you. Can, yes, indeed. Yes. Okay. This is Mary. Um, I have encountered this problem several times. Uh, maybe I've been in the hospital and somebody has come into my apartment and have their own system of cleaning and placing things. And I've had to explain to them that I have my own system and that I need to, you know, do that stuff. I mean, you know, I don't mind if they vacuum or, or whatever, um, you know, what they're trying to be helpful. But like if you have items that you place in a certain area or if you have things that projects that you're working on, you have to communicate that. And I know communicating that to relatives, sometimes you feel like you don't want to hurt their feelings, but try to do it in a polite way um, so that they understand and try to explain that, you know, because you can't see, you need to place things where you know they're going to be. Um, how did that work out for you once when you did that? Well, one sister, um, she recognized the problem and she respected my opinion. And the other one has a difficult time doing it. Yeah, it's a matter of control, and it's also the personality of the person you're dealing with. So sometimes you have to be more adamant uh, with some people than others. So what I have to do then is one sister can help me more than the other sister. Yeah, you've recognized who your ally is and you've yeah, recognized and it's, who you so have I to love them both together. and yeah. it's just that they're two different people and you have to approach them differently. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, sharing that story. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mary, this is Caitlin. I couldn't agree more with everything you said my family came up for christmas and they wanted to reorganize my house and I know. that they, just 
Oh, that was awful. Because, you know, you can't find anything when somebody else puts something because you can't see, like, the big picture. Like, at least I can't. You know, I kind of zero in on things. And not being able to see the big picture with my vision makes it where, like, it's impossible to find anything if somebody else reorganizes. Because then impossible. they'd have to explain the order to you. Mm -hmm. and And, you know, that's time-consuming in itself. So... If my sister who respects me, if she has changed things, she will uh, bring my attention to it and say, I think this is better. This is what I did. If you don't like it, we can put it back. I mean, she's very, you know, and the other one is like, this is better. <laughs> Learn it. <laughs> so she doesn't get to organize my stuff. And neither one of them, I really don't want either one of them to organize my things, but one of them is more respectful than the other. Yeah, and, and you've sort of brought things to a, a good point, which is that uh, a lot of times people, I don't want to say do bad things, but they do things that are not in our best interest, but they do it because they feel like they are doing something good. Yeah. And so a lot of times that advocacy may seem to some people like you're just being mean or, you you know, you're um, but know. Really you're just kind of standing up for yourself and saying, look, this is what I need. Please don't. Yeah, you know, don't don't cross that boundary because I, I, you know, I've either worked hard to get to this point or, um, you know, everything else that, that sort of you mentioned. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I can identify with that. I mean, there are times when I need help from some people, but it, I, I wish they would let me ask. And I've, you know, pride sometimes gets in our way, but I have learned to be humble enough to ask sometimes. So Absolutely. that's when, Absolutely. you know, otherwise, please just, you know, <laughs> say, can I assist you? And I'll say, no, thank you and move on. Yeah. And, and with that, I, again, I appreciate you saying that. I'm not sure exactly how much time we have left, but if we have time for another person, that they might have a comment or question. All right. Thank you. We've thank got you. about three minutes before we go to our next break. Um, so do we have any other questions or comments? Not seeing anything in chat. Anybody want to share by phone? Yes, I would like to. Hi. Hi. Hi, um, this is Dana. Hi, Alex. Hey. Hi. How you doing? Um, Good. Alex knows me, and I'm recently more blind. And I've found that trying to learn things virtually or on the phone has been difficult for me because I'm a little older than that 72 year old. But um, waiting for the time when someone to come back and do things with me patiently um, to learn to new, use my new computer. Um, what would you suggest, say, for a local volunteer or whatever? Um, uh, there are certainly computer techs that will go beyond um, the things that we, you and I do. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that they, you know, they would be happy to, to sort of guide you, um, sort of, you know, past just doing the Zoom calls and things like that, right. um, because it, you know, it does require a little bit more time. And so going back to that advocacy thing, uh, know what you want to do in terms of, you know, uh, once you contact these folks, um, mm -hmm. And then just reach out and see who, you know, who fits best in learning. Right. Well, um, I was recently in touch with, and I, they haven't interviewed me yet, with At Home Alexandria. And I think briefly they sort of mentioned that they had somebody who could do computer training. And that's, that's a paid service. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't mind doing that, but just wondering, you know, what's out there now that I've had both my shots <laughs> sort of okay. clear for a while. Well, I, 
what I'm going to say is um, shoot me a text. Let's set up something, you and I, so that we can sort of talk this over and, and you can kind of figure out what you need from those people, uh, okay. from those folks. And then that mm-hmm. way, when you kind of step into them, um, you know, you're ready and you're not spent when you're wasting your time and you have that good, good advocacy skills about. Okay. All, All right. right. I, th- I think that is my time. I appreciate you guys waiting for me through all those uh, technical difficulties. Uh, so thank you. And uh, I am done speaking. This is Alex. Thank, thank you very much, Alex. That was fascinating. Um, and to answer the last question um, a little bit further, we may get a bit more information in our final panel about library services. Many libraries in the state do offer technical support training, and it's not super in-depth, but we may be able to give you some insight into the supports that we can offer at libraries around the state. Um, does I'm going to, um, Sarah, you said there were no questions in the chat. That's correct, yes. Okay, I'm going to unmute everyone. So if y'all have questions for Mary Lee or Holly, um, feel free to ask them. All right, I unmuted. If, y'all, if anyone has a question. I have a question for Holly. Okay, I'm listening. My question is, you've had a lot of interns come through and I know a lot of them have been thinking about sort of work or college. What would you say are the three skills that all of them needed to build up before they go on to that next great adventure? They have to be well organized. They have to have their alternative techniques of blindness intact. In other words, they, they, need, they need to be able to travel. They need to be able to um, communicate in Braille and in print because you can't communicate in Braille with the sighted world. But the Braille reading, and, but, and, well, I won't say everyone. You need to have some method of being able to read material and you have to have a work ethic. I find with my very young people, I have to help develop. I love my senior citizen interns because they come already with that that work ethic, but work ethic means you come in on time. It means that you don't decide not to come if it's raining out or cold out, you have to you have to want to succeed. That is great to know. Thank you. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, does anyone else have a question? This is Sandy. I had a question for Holly. Um, is Volunteers for the Blind? You said you started that organization. Is that? National, or is that in what area is that in? For the most part, the greater Fredericksburg area, I would love to develop it into a national organization. I was just talking about that with somebody the other day, but right now it's local to Fredericksburg, but whenever we can, we serve people. Of Beyond Fredericksburg, a while ago, I got a volunteer application from Ellicott City, Maryland, because someone hadn't had made an error on our website and said we this is when we were in uh, William County. It was supposed to say we were a countywide organization. It said we were a countrywide organization. Oh. So we got calls from all over the place for the longest time until that got taken care of. So I didn't know what I was going to do with this application, except a very good friend of mine who is also our computer instructor, lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. And one day she said, can't you find me a volunteer? I said, you know I don't serve your area, but and I remember this mother and daughter in Ellicott City who wanted to be a volunteer team. So we went ahead and matched them. And I'm 
still helping people in Prince William County because they're holdovers from when we had our organization there. But sometimes we'll get it. One day we got um, a, we got an application from a volunteer in the Montclair area, and I knew one of my former interns lived there and could use somebody. And even though she has moved now, they're still friends. Well, that sounds wonderful. Thank you. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Who's your question for? Um, I guess it could be for Holly. She just mentioned that she knew someone who could do computer training. And I just, I found that I could not work my Mac. So I got a Windows 10 and I need computer training, but I'm in Alexandria. So I was wondering if someone knew of a volunteer who could do extensive, uh, perhaps hand-on uh, computer training, desktop. I'll have to ask Renee about that. Right now, she's doing a lot of virtual activities, but she's been, she's been traveling for the last several months all the way between Silver in Fredericksburg to work with my person. I don't know if I could persuade her to travel to Alexandria, but I know absolutely she would be happy to work with you by telephone. Okay. Um, I I've had both my shots, so I'm, I'm okay. That's fan and fantastic I'm to know. The um, You may also be uh, interested in knowing that our other presenter that we had lined up for this session, Alex Castillo from the Virginia Department for the Blind and Vision Impaired, part of what that department does is help with learning technologies. Um, so that may be another conduit for you as well. Right, I can give him a call. Um, we just ended our session. I just ended my session with him or he with me after a couple of years, but he hadn't been able to get out for the past year, of course. But I can give him a call and ask him. Okay, and this is Sandy, uh, one of your hosts. I wanted to just uh, read that someone in the chat said that in Austin, Texas, they have a Facebook group called Runner City, and it's for anyone who needs assistance with a variety of errands and odd jobs like shopping, picking up food and medicine, yard work, moving, really anything, but it's it's not disability related. She said people tip the runners based on what the work is. Uh, she thinks it's great. And there's also the next door app for finding assistance, including volunteers. I never would have thought about using next door for that, but that is a fantastic idea. Kimberly, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm on the phone, so I'm not um, accessible to the chat right now. So mm -hmm. could you later send me the emails of people who have spoken? Um, yeah. Are you all okay with that, Holly and Mary Lee, sharing your emails? Sure. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. All right. Do we have any other questions? Um, so if everyone could just um, come back at 210 or y'all could just stay on mute and walk away from the computer, get a snack, whatever y'all need to do, and we'll be back at 210.